In today's vlog, I'm gonna talk about three books that I read because you guys told me to. Let me explain. In August, I did a page 112 tag where I shared three new releases that I was thinking about reading, and I asked you guys to choose which of the three books you thought I should read from the new release table. And the responses were varied. Some of you chose the book that you wanted to hear about. Some of you chose the book that you thought I sounded most enthusiastic about. And so I decided to read all three of the books. And so this reading vlog is going to be about those three books, how I read them, when I read them, what I felt like when I was reading them, and my thoughts when I had wrapped up the book. First book that I read was Anne Young's Meet Me at the Museum. And now you'll see me going about the city, meeting no one at the museum. But reading this book, so I read Meet Me at the Museum, and I went to the museum, the Museum of Natural History, that is, because this book is about um, artifacts. It's about a man who's a curator of a human artifact, and that's kind of what you find at the Museum of Natural History. So I read a book about the museum, and I went to the museum. Meet Me at the Museum is epistolary fiction. It takes place entirely as a letter exchange between two people who've never met, Tina and Anders. Tina is, uh, they're both older people, but when Tina was a schoolgirl, she and her classmates wrote a letter to a professor named Glob. He was an archeological professor and his group, I think, was responsible for discovering the remains of the Tolland man, who's a real life person who lived about 2000 years ago. And his almost perfectly preserved remains were found in the Danish bogs and put into a museum and when the professor received the letters from these girls, he dedicated his book to them in the hope that they would spend their lives discovering things about the world and sharing it with other people. And that dedication prompted these girls to live their lives kind of thinking about this Tolland man, but also thinking about what they wanted to do with their lives. And two of the girls, especially Tina and her best friend Bella, always planned to visit the museum to see the Tolland man display and they never did. When Bella dies without them ever having taken the trip, it prompts Tina to start contemplating her life, the changes that she needs to make before her own life ends. And she writes a letter to Professor Glob, who by this time is deceased and the letter is intercepted by the curator of the museum, who's, who's Anders. And because she doesn't have an electronic way to communicate with her, he's forced to write her a letter. And what follows is a really endearing exchange between these two people, two older people who are looking for something that they never got in their lives. Both of them were married to people who they didn't really feel they had fulfilling relationships with. Anders married a woman named Brigitte who suffered a traumatic experience as a child, having been abandoned by her mother and possibly abducted by another man. And she spends their relationship not really being present. He feels like she's pretending to love him, pretending to love their children. And eventually when she disappears, he's not even sure how much of her was left in their relationship even before she left. Tina, on the other hand, married a man named Edward kind of in a shotgun wedding scenario because she was pregnant and kind of forced to marry him and live with him even though they seem to be having very distinctly different lives even throughout their experience. The complication to the relationship between Tina and Anders is that while Anders' wife, Bridget, has died, Tina is still very much married. Edward is still present. He is still there. Even if a big part of their lives are separate, they are still married. They've still taken vows. They still have a whole life together. And yet, the relationship that develops between Tina and Anders is beautiful. The conflict for me is whether or not this justifies cheating. What of this relationship that these two people have is about cheating. The fact that they aren't really making any plans to move forward in a physically intimate relationship. Would it be different if Anders was a woman? If a female curator had responded to her letter instead of a man, would we look at the relationship between Tina and Anders as being different? The things that they're able to provide for each other that they're not getting from the other people in their lives and the other relationships that they are part of, can we fault these people for finding joy in writing to each other? And so 
I liked the emotions that this book evoked. I liked the way Ann Youngson pushed me into thinking about the relationship between these two people and whether it was a little supercilious to write it off and say it was cheating, emotional cheating or whatever. And then of course there's a complication later in the book where there's a case of whether the hunter is the hunted and I like that. One of the things that I really liked is that the author is also an older woman. She's a retired woman and it doesn't say what she's retired from, but she's retired and she has three grandchildren and this is her debut novel. And it felt like it wasn't so much a novel, like you could read about this being her real life and I loved it. There was a moment in here where I stopped and I cried I was reading this to my friend. I read a passage to my friend and I cried. I just, I took a moment and I just cried. And I love when a book makes me cry, even if it's not a situation that I feel like I should be crying about. I loved a lot about this book. I'm giving this four stars. I think this author did the epistolary exchange really well. And I like the conflict that she aroused in me that made me not sure whether I felt the way I wanted to feel or whether it was okay for me to feel how I was feeling. I really like that. I'm giving this four stars, Meet Me at the Museum, first book of this reading vlog and... I'm reading The Emperor of Shoes by Spencer Weiss and it's about a Jewish American man who's living and working in China. His father has a shoe company there and the son is being groomed to take over. The young man is 26 and he's met this woman named Ivy. She's 36 years old. And so far there's been mention of Tiananmen Square, but I'm not sure of the timeline of the novel yet. So I'm about 100 pages in and more later. hear me when I was in the train station so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about The Emperor of Shoes I'm reading. This is a new release by Spencer Weiss and the author's life I think is probably mirrored in this book. It's about a Jewish American man who's living in China. His father owns a shoe company there and Alex Cohen is his name. He's 26 years old and his father's groomed him to take over the company and in fact right in the beginning of the novel there is a little bit of an exchange of power. The father started giving him more errands, more responsibilities. But at the same time, Alex gets involved with a Chinese woman named Ivy. She works in the shoe company and because of his interest in her, he starts trying to promote her and try to give her special favors. But Ivy is working in the shoe company she's working in the factory but she's really overqualified for the job she's doing menial labor that a lot of these um, migrant workers people who've left their communist backgrounds and their very repressed backgrounds and are working in the city and working in the factory in exchange for freedom but she's there not because she's underprivileged but because of some political reasons and she's using her relationship with Alex she's using his desire for her in order to accomplish some political objectives there's a lot of discussion about communism and political agenda in terms of what you can accomplish in big companies what are some of the compromises that you make in order for capitalism to occur and what is the link between capitalism and communism? Can one support the other? And does one even depend on the other? In the book, there's a discussion of the advantages of having these factories in communist countries or countries that still have some links to communism. So in countries like China, what are the benefits of having these people who have this mindset of work, 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 they're not really focused on the pleasures of life, but in their duty, in their service. Where I am in the book right now, Ivy has mentioned Tiananmen Square, and so I know that there's a link and a discussion to revolt and the rebellion against the oppression and the revolt against the government and the corruption of the government. And the writer's life is reflected in this book because he's also a Jewish American man whose father has a shoe company in China. So I'm wondering how much of the story is autobiographical and how much of it is fictionalized. So 
that's also a really interesting take. Now that I've finished Emperor of Shoes, let me tell you what it's about. The main character is Alex Cohen, although they call him Cohen. He's a 26-year-old Jewish American. He's from Boston, but they're living in China because his father owns or is a partner in a shoe factory there. And Alex has just been given the keys to the business. Literally, his father gave him the keys to the business. Well, the premise of the book is that they're in China because they're Jews and they're mercenary and they're looking for the easiest way to make a quick buck. And so they're in China because the poor working conditions are made possible because the Chinese have gotten accustomed to poverty, poverty that they endured and grew accustomed to in the communist regime. So this is the tale of capitalism made possible by communism. The ultimate irony. Another principal character in the book is Alex's father because it wouldn't be a real story of Jewish family if we didn't have a comparison of the father and the son. And in this one, Alex's father is a philandering bigot. He's cheating on his wife with a Chinese woman. And of course, he wouldn't be happy unless his son was an exact carbon copy of himself. So the author includes a lot of scenes where Alex rails against and chastises his father for his characters. But there are also many instances where we see Alex also becoming a lot like his father, even to the point of choosing a Chinese girlfriend himself. And as it relates to his Chinese girlfriend, of course, there's a love interest. Alex's girlfriend's name is Ivy. And because she's a Chinese girl, Ivy is not her real name. And there are lots of references to the poison ivy, which lures you in because of its beauty, but ultimately is dangerous. Part of the danger is that Ivy works in the company. So Alex is her boss. She's also 10 years older than him. She was also involved in the rise in Tiananmen Square in 1989, which means that she has some political agendas. And her reason for getting together with Alex, who's 10 years her junior, seemed to be to further her political agenda not just about romance. So we have this comparison of love versus taking advantage of someone. And we have the comparison of Jew versus China. We have capitalism versus communism. And it's all very well done. This is not, the book didn't sparkle as much as I wish it had, but there are a lot of themes in here that I love the exploration. There are a lot of other literary and political references. There is the discussion of Trotsky. There's a discussion of communism and the communist regime and the rulership of Mao's government, of the Nazi rule and comparison between Nazi rule and Chinese communism. There there's also mention of Chinese suppression and the patriarchy. The fact that Alex's company, Alex's family business is about shoes and we calling him the emperor of shoes. There are lots of references to shoes and feet and what that represents in literature. And I thought that that was so interesting, such a great theme. Overall, I think the author accomplished a really unique story here. I'm always fascinated to read stories about Jews in other cultures and how they assimilate and how they stand out, what makes them different and what makes them the same. And so the Jews in China theme is very new to me and I thought that the author did a really great job with that one. The economic comparison was done very well, as was the comparison between Nazi rule and Chinese communism. And so I'm recommending this one if you haven't thought about or haven't heard about this book before then definitely check it out if you're a fan of books that deal with the Jewish religion and culture but not from a religious perspective then you might enjoy this one as well so I'm reading the Mandela plot by Kenneth Bonnert and it's making me think about some things that I never really thought about before so the plot of this story the plot of the Mandela plot is, is that we have this Jewish American who's living in South Africa who was born there and so he's taken for granted the life and the privileges that he has in fact he doesn't even acknowledge the privileges that he has because he's been born into them. But then he has these two encounters that have him thinking about his life in a very different way. One is that he's bullied by some guys, some thugs from a school where his older brother attends and they leave him alone when they find out who his brother is. So his family saves him from that snafu. Then a couple of years later, he's a little older, he's 17, and he meets this American woman who's come to South Africa because she wants to get involved in the rebellion to spread awareness of who Nelson Mandela is, and not just Mandela himself, but the ANC and the fight for democracy and freedom for these African blacks. And it causes this young boy to acknowledge 
acknowledge some of his privileges. We also see him railing against his identity because he's been having this recurring nightmare about saving his grandfather or, well, really having to choose between saving his grandfather or leaving the legacy of his family history and the Jewish history behind. So it's really interesting in that they're comparing the privileges of whites in very different places. So we're comparing the South African Jewish white with the American Jewish white. And we're comparing the Jews and the persecution that the Jews encountered throughout their history with also the persecution of the South African blacks. We have this person who's speaking about the ANC and whether Mandela is the one who's in prison or it's the other people who have kind of pen themselves in and I'm liking it so far I think I might finish this today it's 400 and something pages but I'm really liking it and I have a few hours to read the book is over 400 pages <laughs> okay that was a close one the book is over 400 pages and that's because the author is using a lot of Afrikaans and translating to English Instead of dinner and a movie, I guess it's a lunch and a movie. I'm gonna drop off the Mandela plot and finish reading it. And I'm not sure how to explain what I think about it. There are things I liked about the story, there are things that I didn't. The story is about a South African Jewish boy and his experience during the time when Mandela is about to be free and what the political climate is like in this country and how he gets involved in terrorism when he's really just looking for a relationship with an American woman. There's this young woman named Annie, she's also Jewish. She comes from New York to South Africa, but she's part of the resistance and she has these tapes that she needs someone to help her transcribe. Because he has a crush on this girl, he finds himself kind of wrapped up in her political interests and starts breaking rules starts getting himself in trouble in school because of his attempts to help her and so while he is a clueless teenager wrapped up in a very complicated relationship with an older woman he's also finding himself in the middle of his family drama his older brother is in the war and his parents are also involved in some kind of violence is it violence his parents are involved in something and so the discussion is about race what it means to be white whether white Jews or white German sympathizers or white South Africans she are seems the like same. a very nice lady <laughs> thank you <laughs> so the discussion becomes about white and white privilege and what it means depending on the background of said white person there's a comparison, of course, between the white South Africans and white Europeans, white people who are Jewish versus white people who are German sympathizers versus white people who are from America. And there's a lot of discussion about the ANC and the revolution to release Mandela and what that revolt meant for Africans, both blacks and whites. And of course, embroiled in all of that is the discussion of Jew and persecution. The thing that I didn't necessarily love about this book, it's really long, it's really long, it's 460 something pages and a lot of it was explanation, like the author uses a lot of Africans as well as Jewish terminology that are specific to him, specific to the people that he's narrating their thoughts and the people that he's narrating conversations with um, like his mother has these terms that she uses when she's talking to him and so first he explains what those terms are and then he gives you the conversation that he's having with his mother and a lot of that back and forth I felt like add up a lot of the text I didn't feel like the book had to be quite so long and I also felt like it detracted from the interest a little bit because every time I had to go back and forth and come out of the story in order to understand the narrative I felt like I got lost and in the back there's a whole glossary there are several pages of glossary so I'm not sure why he wrote it like that if he was also going to put a glossary in the back but the story was interesting 
I didn't necessarily love the twists and turns. I didn't love the main character. Didn't really feel sympathetic towards him. Um, didn't really feel bothered by his details of being bullied or being molested or being harassed by his teachers or the principal, not principal, whatever the administrators at his school. But I felt like it was a good story. Um, it's not a debut. It does read like a debut novel because there are aspects of the book that I think are autobiographical. The author is also a South African Jew living in America and there's discussion about these two young boys and the desire to leave South Africa and come to the United States with a green card and become a different kind of immigrant. And this book dealt with a lot of different themes, a lot of different stories, and I felt like it was a great accomplishment to finish it. And so that's it. That's the end of my three new releases video. I read Meet Me at the Museum by Anne Youngson. I read The Emperor of Shoes by Spencer Weiss. And now The Mandela Plot by Kenneth Bonnard. So of the three of them, my favorite was Meet Me at the Museum by Anne Youngson. Definitely had some themes that I didn't necessarily agree with, but I like the way the author made me think about an alternate view. <laughs> Not necessarily that I'm gonna change my mind about relationships and marriage and adultery but I like the way the author presented her story and made me not sure whether I wanted to judge these people the same way I would have otherwise. Emperor Shoes and the Mandela Plot were very similar and while they did have very similar beginnings I like that they explored different times in history and so they took that Jewish history of persecution and tied it in with other cultural and political issues. And so I like that those two books were similar but also very different. So that's it. That's my wrap up for this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. Subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you next time. Hopefully soon. I haven't been posting very regularly, so hopefully I'll be back to my regular posting schedule pretty soon. I have a big surprise video coming. That's probably going to be the next video that I post. And so we'll talk soon. So that's it. That's the end of this reading vlog. Let me know which of these three books you preferred and if it made you want to run out and buy one of these books to check it out yourself. Thanks for watching this video. Leave me a comment down below. Subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, share this video with someone else who's also a bookworm and maybe doesn't know that I have a YouTube channel. So thanks for watching. We'll talk in the comments and until next time, happy reading. Bye.